So in this video, we're going to be doing a basic introduction to what we mean when we talk about verbal patterns in classical Syriac. Now, depending on what grammar you might be using, the concept that we're talking about might go under a different name. Sometimes it's referred to as conjugations. Sometimes it's referred to as stems. Sometimes it's referred to as themes. And sometimes it's referred to as binyanim, which is a term that's used in Hebrew. But in this video, we're going to be using the term verbal patterns. Now, if you want more information, you can check out my free online grammar of classical Syriac, which is available at www.marcfrancois.wordpress.com. And you'll especially want to take a look at chapter four and chapter eight. Well, I think it's pretty safe to say that for a lot of people, especially if they've never studied another Semitic language before, the idea of verbal patterns is a very difficult concept to grasp. And the reason why it's such a difficult concept to grasp is because we don't really have anything like this in English or in French or in German or in Latin or in a lot of other languages that people already know when they're studying classical Syriac. But even though it might seem like a difficult concept at first, it's actually not that difficult to understand, especially once you get a little bit of practice with it. So what do we mean when we talk about verbal patterns? Well, the answer to that question is, it's complicated. And so what we're gonna do is we're actually gonna divide this topic up into two separate videos. In this video, we're gonna be doing a very oversimplified explanation for what we mean when we talk about verbal patterns. And in the next video, we're going to be a little bit more precise about the different functions that these verbal patterns actually do have in practice in classical Syriac. So if you want to be able to understand how verbal patterns actually work, you need to make sure that you watch both of these videos. Now, before we get into our overly simplified explanation for what we mean when we talk about verbal patterns, we need to spend a little bit of time talking about what we mean by verbal roots in classical Syriac. So one of the most important things that we need to keep in mind when we're talking about verbs in classical Syriac is that pretty much every single verb that we have in classical Syriac is made up of three root consonants. And it's those three root consonants that we refer to as a verbal root. And the reason why it's called a verbal root is because those three root consonants that make up the verbal root form the basis for every single form of that verb in classical Syriac. And at least for regular verbs, those three consonants are going to show up in every form that that verb can possibly take. So let's take a look at one example. Let's take a look at the verb kathav, which in the pa'al means to write. So the verb kathav is made up of three root consonants, kaf, tau, and baith. And it's those three letters that form the verbal root of the verb kathav. And let's take a look at a couple of examples where we see that verbal root. So the first example is the verb kathav tone, which means you wrote. And it's something that's being addressed to a group of men or a mixed group of men and women. And right at the beginning of the word, we see those three root consonants, kaf, tau, and baith. And the suffix that we see at the end of the verb lets us know that it's in the perfect tense and that it is a second masculine plural verb. The second example is the verb echtov, which means I will write. And again, we can see the three root consonants that make up the verb kathav, the letters kaf, tau, and baith. And the prefix that we see at the beginning of the verb lets us know that it's in the imperfect tense and that it's first common singular. And the third example is the verb kathov, which is a command and it means right. And again, we can see the three root consonants that make up the verb kathav, the letters kaf, tau, and baith. And the fact that the verb doesn't have a prefix, but the rest of the verb matches up with the imperfect second masculine singular, lets us know that the verb is in the imperative and that it's second masculine singular. 
And so that's what we mean when we talk about verbal roots in classical Syriac. And so now let's take a look at our overly simplified explanation for what we mean when we talk about verbal patterns in classical Syriac. So just imagine for a second that every single verbal root in classical Syriac had a basic meaning to it. Kind of like what we saw with the verb kathav, which means to write. Now this is a really oversimplified explanation again, but if you wanted to form a verb in classical Syriac that had that basic meaning for that verb, you would put that verb in the most basic verbal pattern that we have in Syriac, which is the pa'al. And the reason why it's called the pa'al is because that's the form that the verb pa'al takes when it's put in the pa'al perfect, third masculine singular. So let's take a look at what the pa'al actually looks like in the perfect tense. And in this case, we'll use the verb katal, which is a pretty standard verb to use since it's completely regular in every form that that verb can possibly take. And so in this case, we're only going to take a look at the third masculine singular form, which is katal. And that basic pattern that we see in the first column is the pattern that pretty much every single verb in the pa'al perfect is going to take, at least if it's a regular verb. All you have to do is replace the three root consonants and you can form pretty much every single regular verb that we see in the pa'al perfect. So again, keeping in mind that this is a really big oversimplification, if you want to form a verb with the basic meaning that a verbal root has, you would put that verb in the most basic verbal form that we have in classical Syriac, which is the pa'al. Now imagine that we wanted to say something that's a little bit more intense than that basic meaning that we have for a particular verbal root. Now if that's something that we wanted to do in English, we would either simply use another verb that's a little bit more intense than the verb that we're talking about, or we might add an adverb to it. For example, if we wanted to say something a little bit more intense than he killed that person, we might say he slaughtered that person. Or we might say he killed that person brutally. And that makes the act of killing a little bit more intense. But in classical Syriac, instead of using a completely different verb or using an adverb that might make the action a little bit more intense, we would simply use the exact same root but put it in a different verbal pattern that's called the pa'el. And again, the reason why it's called the pa'el is because that's the form that the verb pa'el takes when it's put in the pa'el perfect third masculine singular. So let's take a look at what the pa'el actually looks like in the perfect tense. And again, we're going to be using the verb katal. And so in this case, we're only going to be looking at the pa'el perfect third masculine singular. And so notice that in this pattern, the vowel that's written with the first root consonant is bathacha. The vowel written with the second root consonant in most cases is the lama pashika. And the second root consonant is doubled, even though the doubling isn't indicated in the script. If you want more information about that, you can check out chapter 2 under hidden consonant clusters and chapter 8. And once again, that basic pattern that we see in the first column is the pattern that pretty much every single verb in the pa'el perfect is going to take, at least if it's a regular verb. All you have to do is replace the three root consonants and you can form pretty much every single regular verb that we see in the pa'el perfect. So again, keeping in mind that this is a really big oversimplification, if you want to indicate intensive action, you wouldn't use a completely different verb in classical Syriac like you would in English, and you wouldn't add an adverb to that verb to make the action more intense. You would simply take the exact same verbal root and put it in the pa'el verbal pattern. Now imagine you wanted to say that someone caused someone else to do the action that's communicated by the basic meaning of the verb that we're talking about. Now in English, we would either simply use the verb to cause along with the verb that we're talking about, or we would use a different verb that in a roundabout way tries to communicate the exact same thing. For example, let's take a look at the verb to hear in English. How would we indicate causation with the verb to hear? Well, one way of putting it would be to say, he caused someone to hear something. 
Or if you wanted to put it in a roundabout way, you could say, he proclaimed something to someone. Because when you think about it, when you're proclaiming something, you're causing someone to hear something. But in classical Syriac, if you wanted to indicate causation, you wouldn't use a verb that means to cause, or you wouldn't use a completely different verbal root that communicates the same thing in a roundabout way. You would simply use the exact same verbal root, but put it in the afel pattern. And again, the reason why it's called the afel pattern is because that's the form that the verb pa'al takes when it's put in the afel perfect third masculine singular. So let's take a look at what the afel actually looks like in the perfect tense. And again, we'll be using the verb katal. And in this case, we're only going to take a look at the third masculine singular. And so notice that in this pattern, the verb has an alaf as a prefix with a pathacha, and the vowel written with the second root consonant in most cases is zalama pashika. And once again, that basic pattern that we see in that first column is the pattern that pretty much every single verb in the AFL perfect is going to take at least if it's a regular verb. All you have to do is replace the three root consonants and you can form pretty much every single regular verb that we see in the afel perfect. So again, keeping in mind that we are oversimplifying things quite a bit, if you want to indicate causation, you wouldn't use the verb to cause like we do in English or use a different verb to communicate the exact same thing in a roundabout way you would simply use the exact same verbal root, but put it in the AFL pattern. So those are the three basic verbal patterns that we have in classical Syriac. The pa'al, the pa'al, and the AFL. And again, we're oversimplifying things quite a bit, but the pa'al gives us the basic idea of the verbal root. The pa'al gives us a more intense version of the action communicated by the verbal root and the AFL is used to indicate causation. Now the actual functions of those patterns is a little bit more complicated, and we're going to talk about that in the next video. But that's the basic idea of what we mean when we talk about verbal patterns. Now in each of those patterns that we've been taking a look at, the voice of the verb was always in the active voice. And that means that the subject of the verb is the one that is performing the action. And again, keeping in mind that we are oversimplifying things quite a bit, but we also have three verbal patterns in classical Syriac that are basically the passive voice versions of the pa'al, the pa'al, and the afel. And when we're talking about the passive voice, it means that the subject of the verb is receiving the action communicated by the verb. So if you have a verb in the pa'al and you wanted to put it in the passive voice, you would put it in the ethpa'el. If you have a verb in the pa'el and you wanted to put it in the passive voice, you would put it in the ethpa'el. And if you had a verb in the afel and you wanted to put it in the passive voice, you would put it in the etafal. And for now, let's just take a look at what each of these patterns look like in the perfect third masculine singular. So for the ethpa'el, the form is ethkatel which has the prefix f, and the vowel under the second root consonant, in most cases, is a zalama pashika. For the f pa'al, the form is f katal, which has the prefix f, the vowel written with the first root consonant throughout the pattern is pathacha, the vowel written with the second root consonant, in most cases, is pathacha, and the second root consonant is double even though it's not indicated in the script. And for the etafal, the form is etaktal, which has the prefix f. The alaf prefix that you would normally expect to see with the afel has been transformed into a tau, and the two taus combine together to give the hard pronunciation of the letter tau. The vowel written with the second tau is pathacha, and the vowel written with the second root consonant, in most cases, is pathacha. So again, keeping in mind that we are oversimplifying things quite a bit, the ethpa'el can be seen as the passive form of the pa'al, the ethpa'al can be seen as the passive form of the pa'el, and the etafal can be seen as the passive form of the afel. So that's what we mean when we talk about verbal patterns in classical Syriac. 
we're talking about different ways of forming verbs that affect the basic meaning that a verbal root has. In the next video, we're going to see that in practice, it's a little bit more complicated than that. But that's basically what we mean when we talk about verbal patterns. If you want more information, you can check out my free online grammar of Classical Syriac, which is available at www.marcfrancois.wordpress.com. Thanks for watching.